If our message has changed, we need to bring ourselves back in a line with thus saith the word of God because the word of God is the only and the ultimate authority that exists. Men's philosophy and vain ideology doesn't make a hill of beans difference when it comes to eternal aspects of man's being. It's the word that saves us. Hold on. Put your hands up. 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 I want to share a thought this morning along these lines, or actually it's a question. When did our message lose its magnetism? When did our message lose its magnetism? John chapter 1, verse number 14, and the word... Everybody say the word. word. Now to qualify that word, word, let's back up to the first verse. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was. Later on in that same verse, it says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. But the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word. Jesus was the personification, the incarnation of God's Word. I'll say it again so you can let that soak in. Jesus was the personification of the Word in person, the incarnate or the word in flesh among us. The word was made flesh. The word was made flesh. Father, by your grace this morning, I pray that you minister to us in this place. That by your authority and by your grace, Lord, you'd open our minds to receive your word. I ask you, Lord, this morning that you would anoint, Lord, this vessel for your glory. That you, Lord, give me the words to speak, to minister, Lord, your word to, to this day. Let every heart and mind, Lord, be brought into captivity to your word. And, Lord, be there any spirit that would enter into this place this day to confound your word, to destroy your word, to frustrate the delivery or the reception, Lord, of your word. I bind by the authority of the name of Jesus Christ this day. And we give you the glory. Everybody say in Jesus' name. Put your Bibles down. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise, would you? I love you, Lord. I worship you. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. When, when did our message lose its magnetism? And all of the, me, the ministry of Jesus, you'll find people that were excited. You'll find people that were thrilled. Amen. It's an exciting, in fact, study when you go into the scriptures and begin to look at the four gospels. All that Jesus, as Luke says, began to do and uh, to minister. There's some exciting things, some real things that will incite faith among us. His works and his words are, are, are to this day and for, will be forevermore precious and the most, the most relevant thing that any man could set his mind or his heart or, his, or, or commit to memory. But equal to his, the excitement of his life, the, the, the depth of his word, the the, uh, the profoundness of his statements that bring us revelation, that, that uh, cause us to pre uh, comprehend the spiritual things that are not naturally discerned. God's word, is, as we find in scripture, is a powerful thing. One scripture says it is, it is so powerful it, that it, it can divide even down to the most minute elements of man's being. Discerner of the hearts and the thoughts of men. 
But when, when we see in the history of Jesus' life, the ministry of Jesus, there always seemed to be a crowd that followed him. Wherever you look, wherever you, in fact, the, those few moments of time that we have recorded in Scripture that there was not a crowd, it was simply because Jesus had made concerted effort to separate himself, to sneak off or to jump in a boat in the Sea of Galilee and try to cross over to the other side and, and have some alone time with him and his disciples. But by and large, you will see a crowd that thronged the Lord Jesus in all of his ministry for his three or three and a half or so years. Many of the people came because they wanted to uh, see his works or to be a benefactor of one of his miracles. In Mark chapter 3, the Bible tells us that, uh, that they uh, came to him and that they, they uh, thronged him because they they, for there were many that wanted to be healed there in the 10th verse in Mark chapter 3. You go on and you can recall the story of, of Luke chapter 8 where the woman with the issue of blood sought out the Lord Jesus because she had an issue, she had a physical malady and uh, blind Bartimaeus sought the Lord Jesus out because he was looking for a miracle for a divine touch of God in his, in his life. Amen. And then there were others that came to the Lord Jesus and thronged him because they chose or desired to hear his words and the things that he spoke. In John chapter 3, we read about uh, one by the name of Nicodemus who came to the Lord Jesus by night because he wanted to receive a word from the Lord, perceiving that he had been, uh, uh, Nicodemus perceived that Jesus had been sent of, of God, if you will. And then in Luke chapter 6, we find that the Bible says that they, they that came, which came, they came to hear him. They also came to be healed of the diseases and sicknesses, yes, but they, they came also to hear his dynamic ministry and, and the words that he had to say. In Luke chapter 15, the Bible says, And they drew near to him, all the publicans and sinners, for to hear him. They wanted to hear the words that Jesus had to share. Luke chapter 19 tells us this in verse 48. For all the people were very attentive to hear him. They wanted to, they, 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 they thronged him and soaked up his word because they were so passionate to hear what he might have to say in their, in their day and in their generation. When you drop on over to Luke chapter 21, the 38th verse, and all the people came early early in the morning to him in the temple for to hear him. They wanted to know what Jesus had to say because he was the word. He was the personification of God's word. He was the incarnation of God's word. He was the word that walked on dusty roads of Galilee and, and Judea. He was the Word. And then I begin to ponder in our generation today. Look around at our, even our assembly this morning. And I know that there's many sick and I'm not here to reprimand or in any wise to be critical of anyone that is not here this morning. That's not my position. But I believe that, that there is the potential among us that there could be others here this morning that for various reasons have elected not to be here. And I ask myself the question in this, has our message changed? Is there a difference today in the message than there was 2,000 years ago? If the answer to that question is yes, then we need to bring ourselves back in line with the Word of God. 
If our message has changed, we need to bring ourselves back in a line with thus saith the word of God because the word of God is the only and the ultimate authority that exists. Men's philosophy and vain ideology doesn't make a hill of beans difference when it comes to eternal aspects of man's being. It's the word that saves the soul. Not man's word, the word can save man. And then, of course, we would perhaps in a somewhat narcissistic or self-assured fashion say, no, there is no difference in the message today. There are people today that call themselves full gospel. And uh, because they want to be known as people of the word. There are those that call themselves uh, uh, fundamentalists because they want to come back to the fundamental doctrines of the word of God. Then there are others today that may call themselves apostolics because uh, they go back and they say, we preach and teach the apostolic message of the apostles of the, of the New Testament that was an extension, if you will, of the word. Or others may say, well, we're Pentecostals because uh, we take our origin from the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and the word that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. It really doesn't matter what you call yourself, but the fact that it is of a concern is, do you still preach the word? And if you would, could say this morning that there is no difference in the word today than there was 2,000 years ago than what has transpired. Are people different? No. Are our situations different? No. Has the world become an improved place for us to live and to have our being? No. Do people no longer get sick? That's not the case. Do people no longer need uh, guidance in their sin sick uh, situations? No, that's not the situation. The problem is, is that the word has lost its Magnetism. When we look at Christ Jesus in his earthly ministry, he was, and I know I've said this six or seven times, I'll say it maybe another dozen times, he was the personification of the word. He was the incarnate word of God. The Word, John 1, 14, was made flesh. But to our generation, this message of reconciliation has been passed from the Lord Jesus into the hands of the apostles. The apostles turned their world upside down with the Word. But what has happened to the Word today it's not that it's lost its power. It's not that it's lost its relevance. It's the problem is, is that the messengers have failed to get the word out in a clear, in a concise, in an, in an effective way. You see, our message has lost its magnetism because we are the messengers of our generation. If our message, let me back up and say it this way. If our message has lost its magnetism, it's because we, the messengers of the word in our generation, have somehow tainted or failed in the delivery of the word. I'm preaching to saints this morning. I'm trying to tr teach uh, some folks this morning to help us understand that Jesus is not here in flesh except that he abides within you and I to minister his word to this generation. The word is still the same. The word has never changed. But now we are, if you will, the personification of the world. You don't believe it? Go back to the book of Matthew chapter 5. You are the light of the what did David say? That word is a light unto my pathway, a lamp unto my feet. I get those two mixed up. Forgive me if you will. The word is the light. And now Jesus said, you are the light of the word. You are the salt of the earth. So the problem of our word message, Luther's magnetism, is that the church of this generation has dropped the ball. 
three ways in which our message loses its magnetism. Three ways, and I'm not going to be long this morning. Everybody said, praise God. But our, our message loses magnetism, first of all, in that it is misrepresented. Our message loses magnetism because it is misrepresented. This transpires when we sit by idly with our lips closed. This transpires when we sit by with our hands folded. This transpires when we allow other people to define us and to speak as authoritative about us as to what we believe or what we adhere to or how we live. When we sit by idly and take a mute stance in dealing with the word, then the world's going to come up and they're going to bring to the table conclusions, deductions, ideologies, and say, well, those are those people that do X, Y, Z, or those are those, God forbid, those snake handling people. Those are those psychopathic Uh, be healed or die because we're not going to get you medical attention, people. You understand? When we, the messengers, stay quiet, our word becomes misrepresented because somebody else is going to step to the table and define us in their little small box of definition. I have an article here this morning that... uh, Years ago, I read, it come out of uh, a, a particular, a particular uh, periodical or magazine, and it begins to talk about the other Pentecostals. In here, you will see that, the, that uh, the, those other Pentecostals are labeled as heretics. They are labeled as uh, a feuding uh, division of Pentecost. Every other uh, the that they uh, they teach in ancient heresies, and they and they go on and on and on. They, see, somebody else comes up and says, "We know who those people are." Here, let me tell you all about those people. And the only reason why their voice is louder than our voice is because they are speaking, and the church has stayed quiet. Let me let me just come around and tell you something this morning. We need to be bold in the Word of God. We need to be able to speak the word of God. We need to be ready to give an answer to anybody that would ask us why we believe what we believe. We need to be a people of the word. God help us to be a people who know what we believe, why we believe it, and not be ashamed to proclaim the word of God. Praise God. Years ago, I was up in Indiana <clears throat> and uh, uh, there's there's a little bit of a political riff in the organization that I was with <clears throat> at that time in Northwest Indiana. <clears throat> Several churches in uh, Northwest Indiana, which was the sector I was in, uh, decided that they would begin to have a little sub rally system, and they these about seven or eight churches would just kind of get together about once a month, and uh, they would have fellowship. The district was aware of this. The district sanctioned it. Everything was fine. Uh, the problem was that the section of uh, section one of the United Pentecostal Church went from from Illinois all the way over to Ohio. Now, if you know anything about North Northern Indiana, you know that somewhere around between South South Bend and Michigan City, there's a time change. It goes from from uh, Central Time to what is that Eastern Time. And so when they'd have a a rally over in Fort Wayne, that would be an Eastern time. That meant it was an hour later for everybody else over here. And and, uh, uh, it well, it'd be an hour earlier for everybody over in West West Indiana to get over to Fort Wayne. And it was a three-hour drive. So we decided to begin to have this little rally. That's the political issue. But but, uh, somebody got upset. 
And, uh, and uh, so one of the brethren of this little small rally group, forgive me for being long in my story, decided, in fact, I'll tell you who he is, Robert, 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 um, uh, well, I can't remember. Robert E. Lee is his first name. Robert E. Lee. Robert, uh, he's a missionary now. But anyway, he, got a, he decided, he says, I'll tell you what I'll do, brethren. He said, I'll write to the district superintendent and I'll write a letter and sign all of your names and tell him what we think about what he's doing about our rally system. I said, whoa, wait a minute, Brother Robert. I can speak for myself. I can talk for myself. Don't you write a hate letter and put my name on it because I can stand on my own two feet. And we had the first almost fist fight of preachers in Pentecost in Northwest Indiana. Because we can stand and talk for ourselves. You know who we are? We're a one God apostolic, Jesus name, Holy Ghost believing, holiness preaching and teaching, walking in righteousness, looking for the soon coming king. We're children of the king. We've been washed and sanctified. That's who we are. Let the world know I'm not ashamed of whom I am. Hallelujah. Don't let the world define you. Don't let the world define you. Don't let the world tell you who you are. We're not just some cult. We're not just some other Pentecostals. Amen. It does matter. It doesn't matter what others may say, but it does matter that they do not become the predominant voice by which we are understood or recognized. You get it? The second reason our message loses its magnetism. First is because it becomes misrepresented. The second is because it becomes blurred. When our message becomes blurred, it becomes blurred by two different reasons. One is ignorance. Second is hypocrisy. Our message becomes blurred when we are ignorant to our message. When we are ignorant to our message. And secondly, it becomes blurred when we, the messengers, are hypocritical. Y'all with me? Let's look at ignorance for a little bit. I, I just hate to tell you that there is no excuse for ignorance. There is no excuse for not knowing what you believe. When your eternal salvation is dependent upon what you believe. When your receptivity to the grace and the miracles of God are dependent upon what you believe. How you direct your affairs in this present day and whether you hear the master say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, or depart from me, you workers of iniquity. When that's dependent upon what you believe. Why, how, can you say, how can you say it's dependent on what I believe? Because what you believe is what you will do. You, your actions come from a faith system. Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is not funny. Ignorance of, of what you believe is not, there is no excuse for. Acts chapter 17 tells us this. And the times of this ignorance, Paul preaching to uh, on Mars Hill, he said this. And the times of this ignorance God winked at. But that was yesterday. But now, that's today, commandeth all men everywhere to repent. How can you come to repentance lest you understand truth? In Romans chapter 1, in the 28th verse there of Romans chapter 1, and even as they did not retain him in their knowledge, in other words, they didn't study enough to ascertain what they... They didn't get their minds into the word of God in that they did not retain him in their knowledge. God gave them over to a reprobate. They 
just didn't know what they believed. They were played, they played loosey-goosey with the most critical thing of this world, the Word of God. They just dismissed it as being something for the intellectuals or something for a small group of, of, of uh, the kingdom of God or the church kingdom. No, each and every one of us, you know. My job as a parent is to teach my children. That's my job. My job is to teach my children to be functioning, operational uh, persons, individuals in, in this world's economy and society. That means they need to know, have some decent table manners. Is that okay? It means they have to have some, some, some decent uh, behavioral manners, like saying yes sir, no sir. That means they need to have some cultural teachings. They, they need some education how to count money. The school system doesn't, doesn't work for them. The school system works for me. I hate to say this of the school teacher that disagrees with me. The school system works for the parent to teach my children. That's why I take my children to school. Because of my responsibility. They're not society's responsibility. They are my responsibility to teach them how to drive, to how to improve. And you and I, as we work in the kingdom of God, I try to preach and there's ministries that teach, but ultimately we've got to learn so that we can function in the spiritual world and abyss that we live in. We need to know, we need to know. Someday my children will take to, to flight. They'll be gone, in fact. Well, I won't say that. But we've all got to stand at the learning process to serve God. And here's the point. Ignorance. Ignorance is not funny. Ignorance is not permissible. We need to have faith. And faith. The just shall live by. Faith cometh by. It goes back to the word. Praise God. How can you be a benefactor of all God has for you if you don't know? How can you be blessed in your life until you know what thus saith the word? How can you be saved unless you know? We didn't retain the Lord. That's why Paul told Timothy in his ministry, study to show thyself approved. In Hebrews uh, the writer there of Hebrew says this. He said, let us labor in the word. Verse 14, holding fast our profession, our knowledge base. And then, of course, the second reason why sometimes our message is blurred. One is because we ignorant don't, we're, through ignorance we don't know our message. The second is because our message is blurred through hypocrisy. There is a difference between the word known here and the word known here. The difference between the word known here and the word known here is that we can be able to, to regurgitate it here, but here it does not affect our lifestyle. But when the word of God is hid in our heart, that's when David says it changes our lifestyle that we might not sin against him. Hypocrisy is this, is that you say one thing and you do another because the word is here and it's not here. Hypocrisy can also be uh, where there's, a, a, condol there, there's, a, there's a, a separation of what you do and what you say. Hypocrisy can also happen when, when you, you, uh, you just don't believe what you have heard, what you've received. There can be a disconnect in our lives. 
You know, here, here's, here's, here's a prime example when our, our message becomes blurred. It becomes blurred when we say, trust Jesus, but we don't trust him in our lifestyle. We tell the world, believe that he will save and keep and and redeem and heal and and deliver. But yet we are the first one to decry our pitiful and anguished situations of life. And so the world says, I hear what you're saying, but what you're doing is a different message. I've told this story a dozen times, perhaps a dozen times too many. I lived with some friend, family of mine when I was 16, 17 years old, 17 years old. And uh, they were Christians, and, and, um, and I was living with them for a summer vacation. I'd come back from South America to be with them. I was a backslidden Pentecostal boy. They, they and their life was going through the, the issues of life, and they were having some problems, et cetera, miscarriage and so on and so forth. But I'll never forget that in all of that, I uh, came to this conclusion because they, there was a disconnect of what they were telling me and the life that I was seeing them live in their house. I said to myself, if this is what... If this is what this means, then here I am in a better state than Christianity, which you profess. It's a sad thing when we don't live our gospel, but we just proclaim a gospel. And the world begins to see us living. And what we, what they, you know, the old proverbial boy who says uh, to his, uh, his daddy, you know, his daddy got his thumb caught in the linen closet. And you know what dad did when he got his thumb caught in the linen closet? He probably let out a few choice, explicit words that he ought not to. But then when the daddy comes to the son and says, don't you say bad words, the boy says, dad, I hear what you're saying, but what you're doing has more impact on my life. Come on, saints of God. You want somebody to, uh, to follow your message? Then live your message. You want somebody to believe that Jesus is? Walk like he is. You want somebody to come and know the Savior? Live your life as a redeemed child of God. That your light may shine. And that your message of your lifestyle would speak louder than your words. When there's a disconnect between what we say and what we do, we become hypocrites. Double-minded, James chapter 1 and 5. Again, James 4 and 7. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees in the 23rd, uh, uh, 23rd chapter of the book of Matthew because they were whitewashed sepulchers. They had they put on a facade. They had all the right words, but their lifestyle decried what they were saying. Let me stop. Let me back up. Let me gather your attention again. What's the question? When did our message lose its magnetism? When did the people stop thronging the word of God? When the messenger began to be hypocritical. Third, our message loses its magnetism when it becomes Hidden. Loses its magnetism when it's misrepresented. It loses its magnetism when it is blurred. And it loses its magnetism when it becomes hidden. If our gospel be hid, 2 Corinthians 4 and 3, it is hid to them which are lost, and whom the God of this world have blinded the minds of them, The image of God should shine to them. We preach not ourselves. If our message is hid, it's hid because we have not spoke the word in clarity. We have not preached the word in power and authority. Again, ye are the light of the world. If, 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 if the message is hid, it's because we have put a, we have put a shade over. We have, we have put our lamps under a bushel. Praise God. If our message be hid, it's, it's hid because we are ashamed of, God forbid.
Timothy in chapter two, uh, first, Second Timothy chapter one. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. We don't tell Timothy, nor even me a prisoner. Again, he tells us in the book of, of uh, Romans, I believe it is, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 9, for whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory to his Father and the holy angels. When did our message lose its draw, its magnetism? The magnetism was there when Jesus preached. The magnetism, by and large, was there when the apostles preached. Somewhere in the last 2,000 years, our message has lost its magnetism. Because the world has blinded their minds, has blurred, because the world has allowed others to have a louder voice than we. You're the lie of the world. You're the messengers. You are the message incarnate. Praise God. God has given unto us the message, the message of reconciliation. We're going to have to believe it. We're going to have to proclaim it. We're going to have to live it. And far from the least, we're going to have to know it. It's high time that the church live the message. Praise God. I'm done this morning. I, I didn't have a lot to share, and I know it's earlier than most often on a Sunday morning. But church growth does not happen by program. Church growth does not happen by, by talented singers, musicians, or even preachers. Church growth happens when those that sit among us, being you and I, Begin to take this message out of the doors of the church and let the world know that Jesus is alive and that there is hope for their sin sick situation and that there is deliverance for their difficulties and problems. And yes, He does still heal. And yes, He does still deliver. And yes, he can take the, the chaos that we live in and set it straight. He can mend the marriage in, in, in jeopardy. He can blend the, the families that have become separated and children that have become lost to the moms and dads. This isn't a philosophy. This isn't a brilliant, high, lofty ideology. This is the word. This is truth. Praise God. I want the world to know that Jesus is alive. Stand with me, I'm done. I want the world to know that there is salvation in none other, for there is no other name under heaven given unto men whereby we must be saved. And I want to do my part to keep the word from being blurred, to keep the word from being misre misrepresented, to keep the word from being hidden. Praise God. Would you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.